Hi, I'm Kim Kirkwood, and I'm going to talk very pragmatically now about uh, a technique for doing subtotal cholecystectomy. Um, this is essentially a hybrid approach of sort of a fundus first with a twist uh, and a subtotal. Um, the uh, technique is, has evolved over time, uh, I will say. Hmm, you're right, it's not perfect. Uh, my disclosures, I'm on the scientific advisory board for a couple of startups trying to improve early detection of pancreatic cancer, and Intuitive has funded educational uh, reimbursements for TRIPS, but I'm not on their payroll. Um, this is a patient uh, that I saw just about three weeks ago, a 78-year-old man whom I met on Zoom who was all huddled up in his blanket with shaking chills and abdominal pain, not the ideal way to meet uh, such a patient. Uh, we decided to urgently admit him, and uh, he had a bilirubin of 1.6, and uh, an ultrasound that showed multiple gallstones. Um, we can see here, although I'm not going to be able to point to it, I think. Uh, uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, I can now have the magic of being able to show you. He's got a little bit of a thickened wall here. And um, what, what caught our attention was this right hepatic artery that is just kind of anomalously at way too close for, to the infundibulum of the gallbladder for my, for my taste. So we had made the preoperative plan that uh, we would take the cystic artery high and try to use that plane to, to reflect that off and keep us out of trouble there. So it's not a good sign when your, your assistant spends 15 minutes trying to grab the fundus of the gallbladder and you have to use the, uh, the old-fashioned uh, toothed grasper. You can see that the gallbladder was very thickened, it's indurated. Uh, I can't tell how much of this is because it's distended, and we're going to take care of that in a second. I like to start this dissection over the Kalos node because it kind of gives me a clue as to where the cystic artery is and that I'm up on the wall. Here's our harpoon going in to uh, try to decompress this thing. I have only a small hope that this will improve the ability to dissect this particular gallbladder, but sometimes it helps. Um, and, uh, and then we're, we're going to sort of see whether we can develop this uh, optimal dissection plane. I'm sort of sculpting rather than dissecting this tissue, which is never a great uh, sign. Uh, we're going to see if we can uh, potentially use a blunt dissection to develop a plane here. You see that that turned out to be pretty much futile. Uh, so my hopes for getting the cystic artery early under Kilo's node and that my sort of fantasy of how this case was going to go are falling, are falling away. And we're going to have to convert this to a subtotal uh, sort of fundus first uh, with a twist is how I really think about it. Just didn't fit on the slide. Uh, first thing we bring in is the rolled gauze, and uh, that becomes the liver retractor, which immediately you lose when you take the fundus down off of the liver. And uh, that's just a rolled gauze tied at each end with uh, silk. It's cheap, and uh, it also allows you to blot up any bits of blood. We start to bring this down off the liver until it becomes sort of this thickened portion of uh, the, uh, the cystic plate here. And, uh, and at that moment, I, I wanted to pause and just sort of point out that at the time that we asked them to get the rolled gauze, we also want a few extra toys. If we're going to do this uh, sort of fundus first subtotal, it's helpful to have, for example, a battery powered suction irrigator. A 1045 scope becomes important laparoscopically because you have to be able to see over that fundus. If we're using the robotic scope, it'll be fine to get close up. Uh, argon can be helpful if you've got it. Otherwise, we just turn the cautery all the way up. And um, an extra specimen bag is useful to collect extra stones. A five millimeter vessel sealer can be useful here because you're gonna come through the cystic artery on the wall of the gallbladder, sometimes multiple times. I also ask them to get the drains just in case we're gonna leave it open, uh, like a 19 French sort of Jackson Pratt with a bulb in the hepatic renal recess and a 12 French Red Robinson will usually tuck very nicely into the cystic duct orifice and provide controlled drainage of that uh, bio leak. So we basically uh, start here by, when we get about halfway down this plane, when this plate starts to become thick, I realize that the proper dissection plane has moved away from the liver. If we continue in the, at this moment to go down in the only, with the only landmark we have, which is the liver, it will tend to keep you much too close to the liver because you can't discern what this looks like. And that will draw you right into the right posterior pedicle. That is the error trap and why people hesitate to tell you to do a fundus first because you can end up tra transecting the right uh, portal vein. And so instead, uh, the pivot here is to move back into the gallbladder and intentionally get into it. And 
So by doing that, uh, we can avoid that error trap. You immediately get, uh, obviously, some bile, but you get a lot more information. And I think Dr. Barrett's uh, slides sort of showed this as well. Uh, you start to get a sense for what the thickness of this wall is, and uh, that gives you a lot better ability to stay right on the wall and do essentially a submucosal dissection there. You have to work a little bit iteratively here. In this case, he only had a few small stones uh, in the infundibulum. In this uh, case that I'm showing over on this side, uh, much more typical case, there are tons of stones, faceted stones in this very thickened wall. You end up basically taking those out and putting them in the receptacle that the fundus becomes in order to completely clear the stones from the infundibulum. And so here we see that we're continuing to dissect off only what is obviously the gallbladder. We're not, treacher we're not going into any treacherous territory here. We're just hemisecting the gallbladder. Uh, in order to provide this vessel that's going to be a receptacle for stones and also to provide much better ability to dissect the infundibulum. This can be a bit bloody. This particular one was not. Um, and so that vessel sealer can be helpful in coming through uh, this cuff, uh, which we frankly just didn't need here. Um, we can then basically clear this and stuff it into our, our bag. All of the attention is now focused on the infundibulum. We're going to take out the little stones. It is critical to clear all the stones. Uh, we are able to, um, to basically avoid coming back and doing remnant cholecystectomies by clearing the stones and leaving uh, drains behind. And with that, you can remarkably almost never have to come back. This, um, by taking off the top half of the gallbladder, it really allows you to get much better retraction for this portion of the dissection. You can see I'm really attacking the cystic artery here. It doesn't stand a chance. I'm gonna capture it here right under Kalo's node. And at this point, because that frozen part of the gallbladder is gone and we are left just with this infundibulum, you can really work this plane very hard. I, I go after the artery early, and I do this in a lot of cholecystectomies, not just when it's horrific, um, because I find that this artery is a violin string that's tethering the triangle dissection and really preventing me from getting optimal retraction angles. And so I will frequently take the, the artery as an, as an early event when I take it high on the wall, uh, usually under Kalo's node, where I'm confident of what it is. Um, so in this case, uh, dividing it does provide a bit more uh, exposure. This is an older guy. I would kind of love to not have to commit him to a biliary fistula. I've already sort of discerned by this point that he's got bile coming through the cystic duct. Sometimes it's such an, a, a severely inflamed and occluded cystic duct that you really don't have that risk. Now we can really look inside the in infundibulum and get all the remaining stones and sort of get a sense by looking from here what this wall thickness is, what this wall thickness is, and we can then extrapolate what this wall thickness must be and stay right submucosal. I also pull on it and see whether or not it's coming away from the liver. If it doesn't come away from a liver, this is, this, we're done, we're just done. Because we're then gonna have to choose to leave that portion of the gallbladder in place as a protective barrier against the right hepatic duct and right uh, posterior pedicle injury. Here, I know I need to do a cholangiogram because he had elevated LFT, so I'm going to take some additional bit of this uh, infundibulum off. I call these calamari rings. They kind of come off circumferentially in order to get me down safely uh, to where I want to do my cholangiogram. The cholangiogram is done by dropping, in this case, just a ureteral catheter uh, that we're going to clamp to the sidewall here. I'm not going to be able to get great... Uh, occlusion of that because I don't have any way to occlude that hole, so I'm going to drop it deep into the cystic duct. I too am a huge fan, per the guidelines, of doing intraoperative clangiography through the gallbladder if you need to, through a tube if you can see the cystic duct orifice. It, immediately your shoulders drop down three inches because you see that right posterior sectoral duct, you've got your bifurcation anatomy, and you can show that you have not hurt this person. We also confirm that there are no distally obstructing stones, and so he doesn't necessarily need uh, an ERCP uh, or for me to do something fancy to try to get those out. We're then going to uh, proceed to take our remaining calamari ring off, 
and actually work to get down to see if we can get all the way down to something uh, approximating the cystic duct that we could actually get a, a clip on. We only do that in this case because we are able to stay in that safe dissection plane and we're able to sort of satisfy uh, ourselves that we are able to continue that um, dissection. But I have a very low threshold for just aborting the procedure at this point and, uh, and, esen and essentially uh, just uh, truncating that and putting drains in. I milk back on the cystic duct to make sure we're not leaving him with stones that are likely to migrate into the common bile duct, and then we're gonna put a clip on this uh, cystic duct stump. It's a little bit beaten up, but I'm able to get uh, a, a hemolock across, uh, across it and occlude it, just barely. Um, I like to leave a titanium clip, even if it's on only a little piece of um, moonbeam here, um, in order to just mark that spot radiographically. If he does end up with a bio leak and we do an ERCP, I'd like to know if it's coming from the cystic duct stump uh, versus coming from something else. And then we're just gonna take that final remaining little bit of calamari ring off, and he ends up getting a reconstituting uh, procedure. As compared, uh, in this case, uh, to a much more traditional but uglier dissection, like too ugly to watch, um, dissection of uh, for severe acute cholecystitis, you can see here this wall is super thick. This almost looks exactly like the, the picture that Dr. Barrett just showed. Um, this entire triangle is frozen. It is not safe to proceed in this case. So we're just gonna dry up this wall, and I usually use, um, th that was argon, we're gonna use argon here a little bit to, to dry it up and to ablate the mucosa to try to prevent uh, mucus from ending up being a problem in our drains. It doesn't generally happen. Um, and then we're gonna use that as the orifice through which we place, uh, we place our drains. We did do a clangiogram there, as we always do. Probably 70% of the time I'm able to get a clangiogram done in these cases. Uh, there'll be some where it's just occluded and you can't. And then lastly, we're gonna place uh, drains in this situation. Uh, the Jackson Pratt type drain goes in the hepatorenal recess. And I use usually a 12 French Red Robinson is just about the right uh, caliber to sort of snugly fit into the cystic duct orifice. Wherever that drain wants to come out and lie nicely, that's where it comes out. Management of the drain, if there's bile in that drain or there was bile um, it, that I saw coming through the cystic duct, then we do an ERCP. My preference is to do it intraoperatively under the same anesthetic, but we don't always get what we want. Um, otherwise, we do it prior to discharge. Just taking care of that early, and preferably, preferably with a covered metal stent, goes a long way to preventing continued drama with a, um, with a biliary fistula. Uh, we then leave that tube in for about six to eight weeks and let the GI folks take it out when they do their follow-up ERCP and stent removal. Um, the Jackson Pratt usually comes out in the office in a week or two, just like you would have managed a T-tube, for those of you who are old enough to have ever managed a T-tube. Um, uh, with this, we, pu we published this in 2017 and since then have done about 60 of these. We've only had one patient who's had sort of a prolonged course with uh, a, f a biliary fistula requiring multiple ERCPs. He's HIV positive on antiretrovirals. So we think that was part of it. And part of it was, frankly, we just didn't get him caged off well. A covered metal stent will really nicely cage off the cystic duct orifice and usually dry up the drain immediately. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.